Hello, hello, hello. I don't know what I'm more excited for, for the night or the night and all my friends and my sisters are here and people I just want to like hug and grab and kiss. But I can't because you got to stay there and I'm going to stay here. Um, welcome to our rare but real conference. My name is um, Erica Lawson. My husband is Jeff Lawson. He's one of the pastors here and we're just excited um, that you've decided to join us. We would like to welcome our friends on live stream and doing watch parties. We've got people in grays um, joining in with us tonight and um, all over, all over, wherever you are, you are welcome. And we're excited to just be able to spend this time with you. Um, I'm excited for this night. This night um, has just been I don't know, years in the making, I guess, just of, of, of getting together and hearing from these, these women and this family. And this church is just such a, a wonderful church and how it just helps us to, to grow strong families and be strong women. Um, today's National Daughters Day. My girls were over there. Um, I have four daughters and I'm standing there waiting. They're like, Mom, Mom, you got a minute. You got a minute. You got to go. You got to go. You got to go. So I'm thinking of just how... What a blessing it is to um, gather together with our daughters, our, our friends, sisters. Um, I, just, I just hope that you're excited to be here and know that you are welcome. Um, I'm going to pray, and um, we're going to hear from Audrey, Miss Audrey, who is Pastor Carl's um, wife, in just a moment. Father, I thank you so much for this evening. I pray that all that uh, is said and done here will just bring you great honor. I thank you for this church, Lord, a church that takes your word seriously and people that desire to obey you. Please help us. Help this night be all that would honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Erica. Well, my name is Audrey Brogy, and for those of you who may not know me, who might be watching my live stream or even here, um, I am married to Carl. He's the senior pastor of this church, and we've been married for, th um, for 40 years, and we've been here in this place for 30 of those years. We moved, we started our move from Texas all the way to here on our 10th wedding anniversary, and later in the day, we looked at each other and said, do you know what today is? And we both realized in the evening that it was our 10th wedding anniversary. We have been, as I said, been married for 40 years. We have five children, and they're all grown, and we have 13 grandchildren. And sometimes I tell my grandchildren that one day, should the Lord tarry, I will be just a distant memory to them. But I want them to know God's truth, and I know it takes a generation of faithful women to pass down his truth to the next generation. And we don't live forever. We only have a window of time that God has given us to be on this earth. He says he gives us 70 years of due to strength, 80. That's what he says in his word, and that's still, that's still true today. I'm 62 years old, and I'm in the older generation. And all these years, as I have raised my children and as I have invested in my grandchildren, I have been praying, even as a very young woman, that God would raise up young women in the next generation who would love him, who would live for him, and who would tell of his greatness to the next generation. By God's grace, I see it in these three young women that you're going to hear from tonight. You know, in Proverbs 31, verse 10, when King Lemuel's mother is instructing her son about finding a wife, he said, she, I mean, she said to him, that, and he wrote it down, an excellent wife who can find. And the, the, the point about that is she's very rare. An excellent woman is very rare. And as you look in our world today, we know that an excellent woman by God's standard is very, very rare. But they are out there. They are out there. Rare women who love Christ are out there. And that's where the title for the tonight came from. Now, the first one, young woman, I'm going to introduce all three of them right now. The first one is Grace Anna Castleberry. She will be sharing first. She's my daughter, and I can't even begin to tell you how grateful I am to be her mom. I had the privilege, of course, along with my husband, to raise her and to watch her grow up in the middle of four boys, to grow, and now she's a young pastor's wife, and she's the mother of four children, and it's been my great honor as I get older to watch her live for the Lord. The next young woman is Maureen Brogy. 
she's married to our second son, Jordan. They have five children. Now, I first met Maureen when she was just nine years old. <laughs> Had no idea when I first met her that she would be my daughter-in-law, but I call them my girls because I feel like all three of them are like daughters to me. But I could tell even at nine years old that she had a heart for the Lord. And it's been my great privilege to have had a part in her life watching her grow up and see her walk with God through her teenage years in college and then, of course, as my son's wife and now seeing her as a mother and walking through um, the, her life with her husband and children and seeing her walk with God through it all. And the third young woman you will hear from is Kessid Brogy. She's married to our firstborn son, Jeremy, and they have four daughters. I first met her after my son was already serious about her, already very serious about her. I still remember a long phone conversation I had with him when he was kind of introducing how serious he was about this young woman, but I had not met her yet. But I knew that if he loved her, then I would love her. And I can't tell you how much I love her. And she too has such a heart for the Lord. Now all three of them are strong women. I always pray that my sons would marry strong women and that my daughter would be a strong woman, but not the way our culture defines strong women the way God's Word defines strong women. And all three of them are those kind of women. Now, I'm going to sit down, but Elena Lazinski is going to come sing. She is the daughter of our um, pastor of worship, Matt, and he's going to accompany her. She's going to sing, and then after she sings, Grace Anna will start with the Word. Maureen will address the trials and struggles of life, and Kessid will end with the mission. And depending on the time, I'm going to join them and read, and we will um, uh, answer questions that you all have submitted.
Thank you so much, Elena and Matt and Mom. Thank you and Erica and all of the women behind the scenes who put together this event and y'all for coming here tonight. It is such a joy to share with y'all tonight and just to be with a group of women in 2020. So what a joy it is to be here. Um, as my mom mentioned, this conference is entitled Rare But Real, which over the past couple of months really got me thinking and asking the question, what is a rare but real woman? If you do a quick search on social media or Pinterest on what being a rare and real woman is, you will be amazed at what you will find. Yes, for a few moments, I went down that rabbit hole. To save you the time of finding some of the world's messages on what being rare and real means, I thought I'd share just a few with you now. The first one that popped up, which mom, I just knew you would love this one. It said, say what you feel, it's not being rude, it's being real. Here's one on being special, unique, and rare, and I chose to share this one because it's one I've seen a lot in many different forms. It says, I choose to stop apologizing for being me. I release negative self-talk. I love the person I am becoming. I believe in myself and my abilities. I deserve all good things. I am powerful. I accept myself unconditionally. I acknowledge my own self-worth. I am radiant. I am enough. And then the next one I couldn't help but share, it said, you are enough. It's ridiculous how enough you are. And then the last one I share, this one at the end, because I'm gonna come back to it, but it says five things to remember today. You are valuable, you are enough, you have a voice, you are seen, you are capable. What's fascinating to me about these memes is not just the fact that they are half truth lies. So there's truth in them, they're half truth lies, but that makes them the most dangerous type but the fact that the majority of women in our relativistic culture believe them, it seems like the majority of women think they are powerful, think they are enough, think they are unique, seeing capable, real. But the sad truth is if you believe that, you're actually just like everyone else, you're not rare. Just repeating these captions to yourself doesn't make them true. Yet apparently we are so fragile that we need to be reminded incessantly how special we are. And that certainly doesn't make you real either. Being real means that you actually understand who you are. And you can only understand who you are when you know the living God. And that, as my mom mentioned, is a rare thing. I want to talk briefly tonight about someone who is both rare and real. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. This letter was written during Paul's later years after he was released from his Roman imprisonment, after he's already completed three missionary journeys. And so verse 12 starts like this. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came in the, into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I want you to notice especially how Paul describes both his message and himself. In verse 15, he says, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. In this statement, the great apostle Paul is recounting his testimony to Timothy. He is being real with Timothy. He is not telling Timothy how great he is or how special he is or how worthy he is. He is saying how unworthy he is, what a sinner he is, 
This is what happens when you encounter Christ. You truly see yourself as you really are. Paul is saying this, I'm a sinner, and not just that, but I am the chief sinner, the first of sinners, because he was the persecutor of the church. He's not trying to bolster up his reputation by saying how lovable he was to God, and that's why God chose him to be an apostle. In fact, if you look at verse 13, he says that Christ Jesus judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. Can you imagine being on a search committee for a ministry position and a candidate comes in and you ask him or her his qualifications for the position and they say, well, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. You might sit quiet for a moment and then say, well, I think we're done with questions for the night. (laughs) Yet Paul is saying that the Lord chose him to be an apostle while he was a sinner, opposed to Christianity. The same is true of us. The Lord chose each of you not because of your inerrant goodness, but while you were a sinner and opposed to God. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So what this means is that inherently we aren't enough, we aren't good, we aren't powerful, and even though we are made in God's image, we were so weak we couldn't save ourselves. We needed Christ to come to this earth to do it. This weakness doesn't just stop. When we, once we become a Christian. Look at what Paul says at the beginning of verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says that he is given strength, filled with power, in dunamo. It's where we get our word dynamite. Grant, help me with this part. But the point is, it's dynamite into Paul. It's not his own strength. It's God's strength being poured into his soul. He would tell the Philippians in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who endunamos me, who strengthens me, who fills me with power. Of course, by that, he's not talking about winning beauty pageants or, or having the best fashion blog. He's talking about enduring suffering in a Roman prison. But the point is this. All that you need for strength and godliness and holiness and goodness flows from the hand of God. So in review, if we are being real with ourselves and we come before God as we really are, and as sinners and in weakness, it is then that we can receive the love and grace of God. It is then that we can stop trying to sugarcoat our lives and make things seem better than they are. It is then that we can draw upon him for strength. And if we do this, we will be both real and rare. We see this kind of heart in Mary, the mother of Jesus, in her beautiful prayer to the Lord. In Luke 1, she begins, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For God has looked on the humble estate of his servant. So if she were to to rewrite a Pinterest quote, it might say this, five things to remember today. He is valuable. He is enough. He gives me a voice. He sees me. He is capable. I want to end our time and just close with some points of practical application, how to do this, and how to walk in the Lord's strength, because this is where I live. (laughs) With four young children and being a pastor's wife and homeschooling and COVID, this is where I'm living. So there are three main ways that make a woman truly rare in these days. The first is that a rare but real woman lives in community with other believers. Second, a rare but real woman prays. And third, a rare but real woman goes to the scriptures. And these aren't three ideas I came up with. These are three practices that Jesus modeled for us. In his time on earth, Jesus lived in communion with other believers. He was a man of prayer and studied the scriptures. So let's look first at, a, number one, a real but rare woman lives in community with other believers. 
There are 59 one another's in the New Testament. God knew that we needed one another. The body of Christ needs you, but you also need the body. Being active in your church expresses your need and dependence upon God. The church is where Christ ministers to you. It's where you encounter the word of God outside of yourself. I have always, really ever since I was a little girl, looked forward to Sundays all week long, which of course I was a part of this church, so it made it very easy to do. But Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, 6, but God who comforts the downcast comforted us by what? The coming of Titus. We need community in the body of Christ, really need one another. I think we know that now more than ever. Paul says in Ephesians 4 that the church is a body. A body cannot exist as merely a hand or an eye or sternum or skin. We need one another, and we need one another's gifts and encouragement. Unfortunately, it is rare to find a truly Bible-believing community, but the most real thing you can do is once you find that community, plug in and minister your gifts and be ministered to by others' gifts. Secondly, a rare and real woman prays. Prayer is literally dependence upon God, seeking the Lord in weakness and when strength is needed. When you don't pray, you're saying to God that you are sufficient, that you are enough, and that you don't need him. A long time ago, I heard Elizabeth Elliot share five ways to direct your prayers, and they've really helped me pray more and have tangible ways to pray with my children. They're simple, but the first is thanksgiving. And I will always ask the kids before we pray together, whether it's before a meal or we're heading somewhere, I'll just say, guys, what can we thank God for? And I feel like in this season, that has been challenging for so many. I love the simple ideas that my kids come up with, too. Charles will say, we can thank God for my Brio train. But right then and there, we can thank God. And then the second thing is repentance. And I always try to model this one for them, and it usually means confessing my sin to them in the Lord, which quite honestly is very easy because it happens a lot. But, you know, just practically speaking, once we leave the house or something happens, I can just say to them, kids, we need to pray, and I need to confess my sin to y'all and to the Lord for being impatient with you. And so it's just a simple way that I can tangibly pray with them. And then petition is bringing our request to God knowing that he may answer differently than we ask, but boldly asking and trusting him with the answers, which, of course, this is an easy one um, for us to pray together with, but I think it's so important that we teach our children what this looks like. And, Mom, I'll never forget the lesson you taught me on this. You know, when I was a young girl, I was taking piano lessons, and I would go take my lessons, and then we, I would practice at a neighbor's house because we did not have a piano. And I remember Mom went on a run one night, and I was riding my bike with her, and we were kind of talking about this dilemma, how it's really not good to take lessons if you can't really practice very much. And um, I was saying, well, maybe I shouldn't take lessons, and Mom said to me, well, Grace Anna, why don't we ask God for a piano? And let's just pray and ask him, and let's pray and ask that he'll provide something by December. I don't know what month it was. I think it was early in the fall. And she said, let's not tell anyone. Let's just pray that God would provide a piano for you. And I said, okay, okay, well, I'll just pray that we could find some old piano that doesn't, that someone doesn't want or need anymore. And she said to me, well, is that the kind of piano that you want? And I said, well, I mean, all I need is a piano. It doesn't really matter what I want. Plus, I'm not going to ask God to give me something nice. And she said, well, why don't you think God is able to give you something nice? And I said, well, of course he can. And she said, well, if you're going to ask God to give you a piano, why don't you ask him for a beautiful one? If God chooses to give you an old one or none at all, then you need to be content in that. But you have not because you asked not. And so we prayed um, for a piano, and then sure enough, it was in December, I think. My dad got a phone call um, from a church down the road, and they had been 
gifted a beautiful piano that a godly woman um, had played on for years, and her son had restored it, and the church was now getting a new piano, and they wanted to um, bless someone with this piano who would really appreciate it and love it, and someone mentioned my dad, and they were willing to sell it for a very affordable price, and God gifted graciously that piano um, to us, and it's still at my parents' house now, but in that little way, that practical way, um, God taught me a huge lesson that I've never forgotten that he hears when we pray. The fourth one is intercession, and adding an intercession whenever we pray has enabled us to pray and love on more people than I ever thought we could. We'll do it at mealtimes. Who can we pray for? Who's hurting right now? Who's in the hospital? And we pray together. And then the fifth one that, she, that Elizabeth Elliot mentioned was memorize prayers. And so that's just kind of a fun one, the Lord's Prayer or hymns that I sing to my kids at night that are prayers that they'll remember for a lifetime or things that I can pray when I don't know what to pray. So lastly, a rare and real woman goes to the scriptures. When you study God's word, you're going to see again and again the law of God, which is going to show you your failures and insufficiencies. But you are also going to see the grace of God and the power of God that is going to strengthen you and sustain you. Psalm 1 says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. God's word is sufficient for every good work. It's sufficient for doing the dishes. It's for sufficient for mothering a whiny child. It's sufficient for the challenges and the joys of life. To do, to do this well, I found a couple things to be helpful for me in this season of life. And the first one is just to have a plan. So last September, I actually chose Robert Murray McShane's Bible reading plan. You can Google it and find it easily. But I... Um, started that and I just decided that I was going to use it as a checklist. And instead of getting really discouraged when I missed a day, I was just going to check off and not look at the dates and just keep going. And I, let me tell you, I had no idea last September when I started that how much I would need God's Word this past year. I thought my challenges were just being a new pastor's wife, living in a new city, having a newborn, and three other children to homeschool and disciple, and then 2020 hit. And I have been more convinced than ever. God has used this past year more than ever to show me my need for the Lord. A real but rare woman recognizes that she needs God's word the way she needs food. Practically speaking, when I let go of my ideas of what a quiet time should look like, I was able to feed on God's word in a brand new way. Instead of always needing an hour to sit down and have quiet, I just grab God's word when I can. I pick it up when I have five minutes. I listen to it when I'm getting ready for the day. And sometimes, sure, I get up and I'm able to read in the dark. But more often, I'm reading here and there and everywhere. And when I fall behind, I just keep going. And I see that God is growing me. And that I'm not starving. I'm fed. Well, there has never been anyone more rare and real than the Lord Jesus. When he was tempted, Jesus was dependent upon the scriptures, quoting Deuteronomy. When he was under great duress and suffering, Jesus was dependent on prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he labored in ministry, Jesus surrounded himself with the three and the twelve and the host of other disciples. If Jesus needed these things as our Savior, how much more do we to be rare and real women? Thanks, y'all. First, I want to, before I start my talk, just say it feels so good to be back here at this church. It's actually been quite a while since I've been back here. 
And it just feels so good. And you ladies are clearly so filled with the Spirit and love the Lord. And it just emulates from your faces as I look out into the audience. And it's really encouraging. So thank you. I stand before you this evening as a woman who has experienced much suffering. I don't say this lightly, nor do I say it believing that my suffering is greater than yours. All suffering, whether death or sickness, is different. And even if we have experienced the exact same sufferings, it would look different in my life versus yours. God is not surprised by our suffering. In fact, he allows it. Our suffering is not about us. It's for God's glory and for our good. God is sovereign, and he has ordained each of our days. And while I believe this statement, it doesn't mean that I always accept what comes my way easily. It's hard sometimes to accept the things that the Lord has allowed into my life. My days can be very difficult at times, difficult to see, and certainly to understand what God has in mind for my life. There have been days of questioning for me, not questioning whether or not God is real, but crying out to the Lord and asking him, why? Why is my youngest daughter no longer here on earth? Why do I live with a debilitating disease? Why? Why do these things have to be so hard, yet you call me to walk through them? It has taken me years to understand that God can handle my questions. Asking God why doesn't mean that I don't trust him. In fact, he desires to be my closest friend, and he wants me to pour my heart out to him. Besides, he already knows everything that I'm thinking before I even think it. He can handle it. He can handle my questions. He made me and he ordained every day of my life. But with the deep questions, I've learned that I'm called to trust. I'm called to walk by faith and not by sight, as 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us. You see, God has called his children to a life of unwavering obedience, not an obedience that requires faith. Faith and obedience seem to go hand in hand. It's not my job to have all my questions answered before obeying the Lord. Just read Job 38, 1 through 18, if you're wondering about that. No, God calls me to honor him and to obey him regardless of my level of understanding. And I have to be okay with not having all the answers. I'm not God, and it's not my job to have everything figured out before I obey him. I must walk in faith. Tonight I will share with you the deepest pain and sorrows I've ever known. It is my prayer that the Lord will use my story to encourage you and to even lift my spirits as I audibly speak these out to you. It was April of 2010 when I first noticed something was wrong. It had been six months since our third child was born and I was ready to get back to running. Before Claire was born, I was running 30 to 35 miles a week. I'd worked hard for multiple years to become an excellent runner. And I also really loved it. There was nothing quite like ending a long day taking care of children. In fact, at the time, I had three under three with going out for a run to clear your head and to refresh your mind and heart. I had read a lot about running in the years prior, so I knew that my body would benefit from a short hiatus. Claire was born the end of 2009, and I had already decided that I would take a six-month break. It was now April of 2010, and I was eager to get back to running. I settled the kids into the gym's child care, turned on some music, and began running on the treadmill. After three miles, my leg gave out. I took a deep breath, stretched, and got back on the machine, but I just couldn't do it. I went down the stairs, headed to pick up the kids, thinking to myself, that was strange. In all these years of running, that has never happened to me. I continued running, and my leg continued to give out. I was determined to get back to six to eight miles per run. As much as I tried, though, I just couldn't advance. I was only declining. It was time to go see an orthopedic doctor. He told me I had runner's knee, something that was very common in women after childbirth and hip expansion. He sent me to a physical therapist. It was certain after a few months I'd be back to running just as I had been previously. I won't bore you with the details, but I will just say that running only got harder and more symptoms were cropping up. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis April 1st of 2011, and sadly, that was not a joke. (laughs) Um, Jordan and I were devastated. We committed my body to the Lord, begging him for healing. We always ended our prayers with, but not our will, but yours be done. 
we believe then, as we do now, that God was not surprised by this diagnosis. We continue to ask for healing, trusting that this may not be God's plan for my life. But until God clearly said no, we would continue to ask. How will I glorify God through this disease was a question that continues to run through my mind. God doesn't promise me that he's going to heal me. He doesn't promise me that I'm going to ever run again. But it is my job, as long as I have breath and I stand here, to honor and glorify God. So how will I do that? That's the question that I face every day. And it's, I don't want to just be okay with the, what the Lord is giving me. Because I firmly believe that God has given us good gifts. And even though this disease does not seem good most of the time, I know that the Lord is fully aware of it and that he allowed my body to be this way. So I really want to honor and glorify him through it. So I have to be okay, and, and I want to joyfully be at peace with God's decision, knowing that my life is in his hands. So I proceeded to start treatment, only to find out that I was pregnant with our fourth child, Grace. And I will tell you that she was such a bright light in such a dark time. We did not plan to have her, um, and when we found out, we were so excited. Um, God used her, and he continues to use her in our life greatly. I started my monthly infusions t- about 12 months later after Grace was born, and I nursed her for a short time. This infusion would keep the disease from progressing. We were advised against pregnancy while on this drug. If we decided we wanted to try for another child, the doctor advised us that we should, I should get off of the medicine and try in a few months. We were at peace with this plan. We were thrilled with the four children God had given us. We were thrilled with the doctor God has, had sent me to and the plan that he had for us. We were at peace. I was grateful for the children. Fast forward now, February of 2014. Two years of successful treatment and a plan to keep moving forward. God continued to answer many of, answer many of our prayers, but he had not cured me. It was okay. We trusted him. Yes, there were hard days, but we were trusting God through it. My faith in the Lord was not dependent upon my healing. I really knew and understand that God owes me nothing. It was only by his grace that I am redeemed from sin and promised eternity with him. And for that, I am grateful. While going about my daily tasks as a wife and mother, I realized that I had missed my monthly cycle. I was a little surprised by this, but not too much. I was getting older, and life can be stressful at times to cause a natural de- delay. I waited about a week, and I just knew that I was pregnant. This was confirmed by a test. And as I lay on our bed that evening, as Jordan came in from work, it was a late night for him. I told him that I was expecting our fifth child. We were both very surprised and felt a little overwhelmed, to be honest with you. We canceled my next infusion. That was to be in three days from that day. We met with my neurologist, and he was so excited for us, which was really calming and peaceful to our souls at the time that our doctor, who does not know the Lord, but was excited for us to have another child. He said that we had nothing to be worried about. In my head, I was saying, nothing to be worried about. You advised against pregnancy while on this drug. He went, to say, he went on to say that women have had su- successful pregnancies while on this drug, but that it was just still fairly new, and they like to monitor pregnancies. I was in a little bit of, I was in denial. And if I'm honest, at the time, I wish that I was not pregnant. I was scared, and I felt overwhelmed, and I questioned my ability to care for another child. And on top of being pregnant, my ability to walk just became increasingly more difficult. In fact, it was while I was pregnant with our fifth child, Jane, that I got a handicap sticker to make things a little more convenient for me. I was feeling very guilty for not being excited about the pregnancy at that time. In fact, I pulled out one of my old journals and these words that I had written. This was in April of 2014. I said, Lord, please forgive me for not feeling excited. I know this pregnancy is your will for my life. I know that once the baby arrives, I will be so elated and I will not be able to imagine life without him or her. But right now, I just need your help. I'm scared and things look dark and I need your help. 
The Lord answered this prayer beyond what I could have ever asked or imagined. Our children were so excited to hear of another sibling. In fact, we would sit around the dinner table, guessing the gender, choosing names. Um, and my heart was just getting more and more excited, excited that the children felt so excited for him or her to come and excited just knowing that this was of the Lord and our whole family was waiting with open arms. So we answered that prayer. We were getting more and more excited and we couldn't wait to meet her. After finding out we were expecting a girl, Jordan and I went away for our 10th wedding anniversary. And we decided before we took that trip that we, we just asked the Lord, Lord, will you please in this next five days give us a name? We, um, we wanted her name to be different. And not that our other four children were not special or unique, but this pregnancy was different and that we did not expect to have another child. And it was so clear that it was of the Lord that I had this baby in my womb. So we went about our trip and had fun. And Jordan said to me, what about the name Jane? Um, and I said, I think I like that. And he said, it means God's gracious gift. And immediately we both just said, yes, that's the name. She is a gracious gift. Um, she was such a gracious gift, as are all of our children. Physical tasks were getting harder for me, and I just never imagined another baby would be in store for us. So the fact that God had allowed me to be pregnant and given us a name, and everyone was so excited, and she was healthy and growing just as she should be, the Lord was answering my prayer to make my heart happier of the situation that I was in. God has a perfect plan for each of our lives, and he saw it fit for Jane to be in our family. He was entrusting us with another child to raise for his glory. Little did I know the great pain that was forthcoming. It was July 24th, 2016. It's a day that I will never forget, and it's also the day that has forever changed my life. It was a normal Sunday morning. Jordan had gone on an early run, and I was up with our oldest four children. The six of us ate breakfast together. I picked up the kitchen, got Jane's cup of milk ready, even set her banana to the side. I went into the bathroom to finish getting ready. I remember the hot rollers in my hair. I was in the bathroom finishing up getting ready. I ironed the dress that Jane was to wear, and then Jordan went to wake her and address her for church. Claire was with Jordan when they entered Jane's room. He noticed how still she was and how it didn't appear she had moved very much during the night. Jordan set down his coffee and went to wake her. This is when he noticed discoloration on her arm. He quickly swept her from the crib to check the rest of her body. He began yelling at me to call 911. I came from the bathroom with my phone as he was rushing down the stairs with our daughter in his arms. At the time, I had no idea what had happened. Had she fallen? Did she have a fever? I just quickly dialed 911 as Jordan lay her lifeless body on the rug in our foyer. The operator began to tell us how to perform CPR. I watched as Jordan performed this act, and at one point I reached down to touch Jane's arm. It was lifeless, icy cold. It's like I knew she had died. As fast as I had that thought, I saw her chest rise as Jordan breathed his breath into her body. I was hopeful. Could she be breathing? The next thing I remember is the sound of sirens. Jordan swept up her body and ran to the street. The ambulance stopped, opened the doors, let Jordan go in. As soon as they looked at Jane, they knew that she was gone. A police officer escorted Jordan from the ambulance to our front porch where I was standing. Jordan shook his head and just said, she's gone. We embraced each other and began to cry. We have to tell the kids. I just remember thinking, six of us gathered in our front foyer. We told them that Jane had died. We sobbed together and we prayed. We were in shock. What had happened to her? She was perfectly healthy the day before. 
That entire day was a blur for the most part, but I do remember the Lord and the Holy Spirit comforting me and bringing various scriptures to mind. I was reminded that my calling as wife and mother had not changed. It would only be more difficult. I was called to hold on to the Lord and to my family. I didn't know how this would work, but I knew God would help me. I had Elizabeth Elliot's words in my head, just do the next thing. And so I did. While most of that week was a flash and we don't really remember it, I will never forget the clarity of mind that Jordan and I had as we planned the funeral for our daughter. We, I don't even think we slept that week, but we stayed up. We wrote, we wrote what we wanted to say. We chose music. Jane was our gracious gift that the Lord had entrusted to us, and we wanted our family and friends to know what a special person she was. The funeral happened, then came the burial. My heart felt like it was being ripped from my chest. How could this be? How would life go on after burying a child? As the burial service ended, Jordan and I brought our children to Jane's casket. We put our hands on it and sang, Jesus loves me. We always ended Jane's day with singing and rocking to her, and Jesus loves me was one of the songs. With that song, we said our final goodbyes to, earth, to Jane's earthly body. We knew she was with the Lord, but her sweet body, the, the one that lived inside of me for nine months, the one that we held and kissed and loved and taught to roll over and to walk and to talk, that body was being laid to rest and we wouldn't see her again until heaven. It was the hardest thing we have ever done. But God was with us. And I don't really know how to explain that to you other than to say it. When you just have that overwhelming feeling of the Lord covering you, the Lord holding you, the Lord, as Elizabeth Elliot tells us to do the next thing, and he will take care of the rest. That is what God was doing, and that is how we were getting through. The funeral and the burial were over now. The people were gone, and it's not that they were gone because they didn't care. We had people at our house all the time bringing meals, serving us, loving us. I had a friend recently that said to me, do you remember when I used to come in and do your laundry? And I just thought, I have no recollection of that. But God took care of that. Every single detail he took care of. Just do the next thing. This is what I would tell myself every day when I would get out of bed. Love the four who are here. Just do the next thing. Claire said to me in the weeks following Jane's death, Mom, our family is like a puzzle that now misses a piece. Jane is gone and we are here. The puzzle piece is missing for now. But when we all get to heaven, it will be right. How God used my six-year-old girl that day. She was right. Our family here on earth will always be incomplete. Jane is gone, and we are here. The puzzle piece is missing for now. But when we all get to heaven, it will be right, and it will be so good. And I love that verse now more than ever. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. In fact, my oldest son always says to me, we're X amount of days closer to being with Jane again. And that is how I choose to think. We are so much closer to being with Jane again. And then when we are all together again, it's going to be like we were never apart. Life has been so hard with Jane. There are days that seem like I won't make it. But while the weight of her absence has been heavy, God has eased the sting of death as time has passed. It's not because Jane is forgotten. No, we will never forget Jane. We speak of her daily. But I do believe the sting has lessened because we have learned how to move forward, remembering her and honoring her life. Grief comes more in waves now. It's not predictable. There's not necessarily a certain time of year that's harder than others. 
Yeah, sure, birthdays and death days and holidays are always hard. And as our other living children make and reach other milestones, it's also a fresh sting, a reminder that Jane will never meet those here. But we know that Jane is with the Lord, and that is where our hope is with the Lord. We cling to the promises of Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. God promises to help us, and we have seen him do this over and over again. Don't ever doubt God's word. In fact, as Grace Anna was talking and sharing of the importance of knowing God's word, ladies, I will tell you that all the time before I became a wife and a mother, God was preparing my heart for that deep, deep loss. And I was memorizing scripture. I was reading things. And sometimes, ladies, you're going to read a passage and you don't understand what it says. But as you continue to walk with him, he's going to show you. And I'll tell you, for the three months after we lost Jane, I don't even know why, because I wasn't mad at God, but I didn't open my Bible. I read a lot. I read a lot of other parents, bereaved parents who had lost children, and then I had my scripture cards, and I just would continuously go over scriptures in my head. But those were only there because I had done the work in years prior to store those there, to store God's word in my heart for when I would need it most. Things have been far from perfect the last nine years of my life. Ladies, there are days that are so hard, as we all have in this room. But while, while I've never stopped believing and trusting the Lord, there are times of anger and frustration. Sometimes it's hard to walk and to live in the circumstances that I have. But I go back to the scriptures. I go back to the life of Job. I really read that. And I see God owes me nothing. Everything that I have is a gift. And that's how we have to view all that we have. All that the Lord has blessed us with is a gift. And he's never promised for how long a gift is for. I want to leave you with a few of the things God has taught me over this past nine years. I believe them now in my prayers that I always will live in them and cling to these. Number one, God is sovereign. He knows the exact number of our days. He ordained them. He has a purpose and a plan for each of us. Psalm 139 verse 16 says, Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me. I think of that verse that was memorized in high school, but I think of that verse all the time as it pertains to Jane's life. Jane's 21 months weren't meaningless. God had a plan and a purpose for her. He blessed us with her life. And as long as, ladies, that we are all here living and breathing, God has a plan for each of us. It's not time to close up shop while God still has us living. He has a plan, and he wants to use you. Number two, our suffering is not about us. God has allowed the waves and wind into our lives for a purpose. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I feel like I'm going to understand why God ordained Jane's days to only be 21 months, because Jordan and I really don't believe that we're going to fully understand that until we're in heaven one day. But we do believe that it's not about us. It's for God's glory and for our good, all the suffering that he allows into our lives. And so, ladies, we have to take those sufferings, no matter what it is, and entrust those to the Lord and ask him to help us to glorify him through the pain. Number three, our suffering is not because God is punishing us for our sinful deeds and thoughts. No, Jesus has already paid for our sins, past, present, and future, when he died on the cross. And ladies, I'm not talking about consequences of our sins here. I'm talking about suffering because we live in a fallen world, that God promises that those who belong to him will suffer. But that's not a result. You know, I struggled for a long time. I just shared with you moments ago how when I first found out I was pregnant with Jane, I wasn't 
I was overwhelmed. I was hoping the pregnancy test was wrong. And I remember writing in my journal so many times, is this why she's not here? Because I didn't want her. And that's not true. And I will tell you that that's only been the last two years that God has really freed me from that lie. God wasn't punishing me because I was overwhelmed. We live in a fallen and a broken world where suffering exists. Number four, Romans 8, 28 says, For God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It has taken the events of the last nine and a half years for me to properly define what it means that God works all things together for good. I believe this verse, but what I wasn't applying is that this verse does not mean that God works things together according to my definition of good. It's not about me, remember? It's about the Lord. So not only does God not work things together according to our plan, we also have to remember that you and I are not the only people for whom God is working. And finally, number five, God is faithful to all his promises, and we must cling to those during the storm. We must let him be our anchor. And in order to be able to trust his promises, we must know his promises. And sadly, we live in a day and age where people don't know their Bibles. Ladies, especially those of you who have small children at home, teach them God's word. They are soaking it in. They are watching you. They are watching how you suffer. They are watching how you rejoice. They are remembering all of it. But it's not about us. It's about you in those times pointing them to God and thanking him that he is allowing you to walk through this. There have been many verses God has used to encourage me. But my heart always goes back to 1 Corinthians 10, 12. It, it says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. I cling to this verse. In fact, I tell people all the time when they ask how we're doing, it's fuzzy. I see in a mirror dimly. But one day I'm going to see Jesus face to face. And I imagine I will see him and then Jane will come running. So I don't know in part, remember ladies, it's not our job to understand the whys. It's our job to obey. Thank you. Well, I'm so thankful to get to be here tonight. Thankful for the opportunity and for everybody who put this on. I am... Um, I was sure it was going to be hard to go last, and I was right, but <laughs> here goes. Um, do y'all feel at all tired and worn out, just in general? I know I do. Usually on a Friday night, do you know what I'm doing? Like, just staring blankly into space. That's, that's what's happening at this point in the week for me. So you might be young still, and you don't know what I'm talking about, but you'll be there soon. Or you actually might be on the other side of that. Anytime I talk to my parents now, they're just like out doing who knows what on Friday night. So maybe I'm just in a slump in between. I don't know. But wherever you may be, I have no idea what season you're in or what's making you feel your limits where it's something rare and serious, like what Maureen just shared about struggling with MS, or in my case, it's that my sister-in-law who has MS accomplishes more in an hour than I can in an entire week, we all at some point feel our limits, right? There's only so much you can do in a day. And instead of using our resources most effectively, I think we can just kind of dissipate them out without thinking, spin them in foolish ways. I know I can. But I also feel a sense of urgency, 
and I want to use the time that I have well. So tonight, I'm going to look at some themes from Philippians to help us consider how to live intentionally, as Paul writes, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom we shine as lights in the world. So some quick background. This letter was written by Paul from prison to a church he started in Philippi, and they were people familiar with hardship and with persecution. And he writes to thank them for sending financial support and to let them know that he misses them and that he's going to be sending Timothy and Epaphroditus. But the main thing he wants to do is to encourage them in Christ, to remind them of who Christ is, his example of humility, his all-sufficiency, his great glory, and to encourage them that Jesus is worthy of forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead toward the goal for the prize. So as we start and consider how to steward our time, our lives, I think we should begin with the why. And it's what Paul wanted the Christians at Philippi to remember, and it's the glory of God through Jesus. That's what our lives should be about. That's what this talk should be about. So to start the letter, Paul prays that they might be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So he wants them to grow not just for their own sake or some kind of self-improvement project, but for the praise and glory of God. And then the letter ends, it's bookended with, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So it's not like a small side point. It's actually the point. So if you're listening and you're thinking, yeah, I do want to be a better person, I want to pull my act together, then you're actually missing this, the whole point. Why would anyone care about glorifying Jesus? Because everything we're talking about doing, everything Grace Anna and Maureen talked about from being in God's Word, knowing it, treasuring it, to suffering and enduring without ever turning away, Jesus already did it. He did it perfectly. He did it on our behalf with steadfast love for us, and he died and rose, defeating sin and death, making a way for anyone who would turn to him in faith to be right with God. And so for those of us who have said, I want to trade my filthy life for his perfect sacrifice and follow him, now all we're doing is attempting to use our lives as a means to point to him and say, this is my Savior. He did it. Only look to me as I point to Christ. It's his glory. He's the reason for it all. So I want to lay that as our foundation because it's the heart. Now, self-glory is what the world promotes. You know, it's what I want, right? We all want to make a name for ourselves. I want credit for everything. There's nothing good that I do that I don't want people to know about and think that I'm pretty great right? I mean, I feel like we all maybe struggle with that, but it's not about me. It's about Christ. It's in the letter. It's all of the Bible, and it should be all over our lives. So how exactly does that look lived out? Well, glorifying Jesus looks like humble service. Paul writes, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility— Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." So our Savior is our example and our goal, self-emptying. Now, as a homeschool mom, particularly in in D.C., which is where we live, I'm kind of like a pathetic loser. Now, I mean, yeah, in people's opinion. Now, I am a loser, but not for the reasons people might think. They think she has forsaken a career. She has forsaken anything we hold dear And so they might think, wow, she's really humbled herself. Now, I have forsaken those things to prioritize my family. But the tricky thing is, the Lord 
looks at the heart. And I can count myself more significant with the best of them. So I'm here to testify from firsthand experience that you can be with your children all day long, and you can be volunteering in your church, in your community, but you can be full of pride. So where is it that you look to be served? Does it come out when you talk to employees, when you have a customer service problem, or with your spouse or your roommates when you think, ah, oh, no, they need to be taking on the form of a servant? In my pride, the thing that I live for is my own convenience, and I'm tempted to despise anyone who comes my way, whether it's my children, or the slow driver in the left lane, or anyone who comes up with a task for me to do that I think is unnecessary. But it's not satisfying by God's grace. Isn't it God's kindness that living contrary to the way we should makes us miserable? We get the privilege of showing the world what Jesus is like by humbly serving. And instead of asking, where are the places of honor? Who can serve me? Instead, we get to ask, where are some feet I can wash? I don't know what this practically looks like in your life, what season you're in, but your home, your church, and your community are teeming with needs. Don't let this overwhelm you, but instead think, how can I take a single step? We can't meet all of the needs, but in his kindness, God has prepared some of them for us for his glory. So let's have our eyes peeled for the humble tasks. So another thing to note in this letter is that we don't do it alone. It's a letter to a church. It encourages the Philippian congregation to be standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and to be united to look for the interests of others. He encourages them not to dispute and even name specific people. So you don't have to be told to get along and work out disputes with people that you don't even know. Paul goes on to tell the church, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. So we need to be joined in a local church community, finding seasoned Christians to imitate. So young women, be humble. You don't know as much as you think you do. I know I don't. And we need to be looking for those people who are have already walked through those things that we're walking through now and ask for their advice, ask for their wisdom, look to them. Older women, we need you to be soberly walking with the Lord. And if that's not enough, we need you to please make it easy to come to you for counsel. We need both encouragement along with the instruction. Now, I just realized I'm, I'm a millennial. I didn't know this, but I just figured it out. And, uh, and unfortunately, it kind of makes sense. So I just want to say on behalf of millennials, um, I'm sorry we're snowflakes. And as you're dealing with us, just some things to remember. Maybe you're less hardy than the generations that came before you. I don't know. Just bear with us as Jesus is born with you. And I just want to say on behalf of all millennials, I'm sorry. So there's that. All women, if a sister comes to you struggling and you point out how she actually has it easy, do you think that's going to be helpful? So this is a temptation I have, so I, I get that. We love to compare to one another. But no matter how much money you have, no matter how nice your family seems or how smart or attractive or healthy or successful, whatever your cir circumstances appear to be, Satan is actively trying to destroy each and every one of us. We are all battling the world, the flesh, and the devil. So let's quit comparing and tearing each other down, and let's actively seek to encourage and build one another up. Yes, let's provide perspective, but not circumstantial perspective. Well, my house is half as big as hers. Well, I have to work and care for my kids. Well, at least you have a believing husband. And let's give some grace and some weighty, eternal perspective. Like Paul does in chapter 4, verse 19. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Right? Be encouraged. 
The word says God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So although we can see all the faults in one another, and we should call one another to repentance when there is sin, you know what else can be valuable? Is seeing God's grace in each other's lives and pointing that out. Okay, so we're to be united with other believers, humbly working for God's glory. Now this was the real kicker for me, the attitude. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance for you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all, for you all making my prayer with joy. Paul's refrain through this entire letter is rejoicing in Christ over and over again. In chapter 2, verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. All things without grumbling. What a radical mindset. Rejoicing with thanksgiving? Doing everything without grumbling? What is your attitude? Would you say you're entitled? I know I am. Okay, so here's a completely dumb example that you should really judge me for, but it's real, and that's what we're doing here tonight, right? Rare but real, so here goes. Okay, food. I feel like my life revolves around food. So I'm either shopping for it, preparing it, forcing people to eat it, or I'm cleaning it up. So if I make breakfast, lunch, and dinner the entire week, then I feel entitled to a trip to Chick-fil-A on the weekend, okay? And not in like a nice, like, oh, this would be such a sweet blessing kind of way, but like, I'm getting fried chicken and sweet tea or else kind of way, okay? <laughs> but this is not the mindset that I see held out here in Philippians. Instead, it's like, Father, thank you. You provide abundant food so completely and regularly for me. I don't even have to think about whether we're going to have enough because your provision is so regular. Thank you for feeding me and for the privilege of feeding these people I love. Help me to think of ways to open my home to build community through sharing food and to practically share the abundance that we have with others. Now, it's been a few years, but there was an influx of families into our neighborhood from Syria and Afghanistan, and sharing meals with them was very eye-opening and helpful for providing perspective for what I considered a burden. We have so much, and we grumble about our plenty. What are you tempted to grumble about or to be ungrateful for? How are you unable to rejoice and have joy in Christ because of temporary circumstances that you find yourself in? I bet a lot of you have reasons much more serious than food preparation. But we need to be actively fighting to be rejoicing for what Christ has done, for who he is and what he has provided. What is going to come naturally is grumbling and dissatisfaction. And if you're like me, that's the habit that you've been working especially hard on since March. But one way to start working on a habit of gratitude is something a friend's taught me. It's called the ABCs of gratitude. And it's something we do when everyone's in a funk in our house. So we start going through the alphabet. What are we thankful for that starts with an A? Okay, now a B, and so on and so forth. And it always turns out there's an abundance of things to be thankful for. And we can say with Paul, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Amen? Now, if we need to be grateful and humble and fixed on Christ's glory, then we need to be radically focused. Reading further on in the letter, Paul writes, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, the amount of distraction out there is unbelievable. And the hard thing is, it's a lot of good stuff. I mean, even things we should be aware of. So let's take the news, for example. I love the news. I love reading articles. I love politics. But God's word tells me to set my mind on what is true and lovely. Now, is what is happening in the news true? It is true, yeah. But it's only a piece of the truth. You know what else is true? 
what's happening in my kid's life, what's going on in their room right now, what's happening in my neighbor's house down the street. Recently, when I was getting really like spun up on the news, reading a bunch of opinion pieces and glued to the TV, it all felt so heavy and overwhelming. I thought, this is crazy. I don't need reporters telling me how people are thinking and what they're feeling. I can literally walk down my street and go talk to my neighbors, check in on them and ask them how they're doing and offer them true encouragement. And I did just that. The point is, I think that rather than connect with the actual people around us, Satan would rather we stay stuck, setting our minds on things that are partially true, maybe a little impure or unlovely or just foolish, and get distracted by them. What distracts you? The TV, maybe the internet. Maybe it's not the news for you. Maybe it's diet and workout tips or home decor stuff. Does getting lost in the semi-real alternate universe energize you? Just scrolling through your phone? Of course it doesn't. How are you setting your mind on the true, the honorable, the just, the pure, first and foremost, it's God's word. Set aside time to be in it, to be fed by it, to meditate on it, and then to practice these things, as Paul said, by actually engaging your family, your neighbors. So instead of taking 15 minutes reading about the drama in some famous couple's marriage, maybe use 15 minutes to pray for your husband, or plan a date. Or instead of going on Facebook and hating people for 30 minutes because of the stupid things they're posting about the election, you could send an email to your local elementary school and see what needs they have. Now, I would have never thought of contacting my local elementary school, but I have a good friend who's the PTA president, even though my kids don't go there. They've been open to us coming in and helping with their after-school clubs and doing food and supply drives. What about this? This is something I've done. Instead of reading about drama between churches that I don't even attend, I'll invite members of my own church over, and we can sit out in lawn chairs in the yard and just eat ice cream. It's safe. It's low-key, right? It's getting harder and harder to choose the people right in front of us over some idea out in the world. But let's fight not to veg out on our phones when we're with our family or we have work to do. Let's fight to quit neglecting the flesh and blood God God has put around us for electronics or fill in the blank, whatever you use. It sounds crazy, but that is a battle for me every single day. A final point in all of this, we need to be radically dependent. You cannot be humble, you cannot be grateful, or single-mindedly focus on Christ's glory in your own strength. Christ is most glorified when we recognize our dependence upon him. Paul writes, The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Are you anxious? Of course you are. Every woman feels a little off, right? And we're all trying to take control of the situation, whether it be the right workout, the right diet, the right essential oil blend, the right square footage, the right schedule, the right income level, the right 10-year plan, whatever it is. Maybe throw kids in the mix now. We need to get just the right foods in them, the outdoor play, chore chart, Bible verse memorization, academics, not too overscheduled, but joy-filled childhood. Just hit all of those marks. (laughs) Everything will be okay. Do you see how instead of squelching the anxiety we feel, it does just the opposite? It feeds the lie that it's all up to you. The world is more than happy to set all of your priorities, and Satan would love nothing more than for you to live by a set of manufactured standards, relying on self, and then fail and grow and grow in anxiousness. Now, don't misunderstand planning, exercising, memorizing scripture. I'm in favor of all of those things, and the Proverbs have plenty to say about 
the sluggard, right? We're to work heartily as unto the Lord. But the point is, these things are not our salvation. Christ Jesus is our salvation. And when you struggle, when you don't know the way forward, you don't first turn to a life strategy session. You turn to him in prayer. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I had a situation recently, and I was talking to my brother, who's a pastor, and asking his advice, and he was like, that sounds complicated. I'm not going to tell you what to do. You should pray, because it sounds like it's something only God can work out. And I thought, that's exactly right. Do you have messy relationship stuff? things in your heart or in your personality that just don't seem to change, bitterness that won't go away, or other circumstances you're just at the end of your rope with, as my brother would say, God can do more in a moment than you can do in a lifetime. Ask him. Ask him with thanksgiving. Trust him with it. Quit looking to the next system the world comes out with to solve your problem. Take an inventory of all those things that you thought in the past would solve your problem, how did changing your circumstances work? Is everything perfect now? Quit relying on yourself, on the solutions of the world, and lean on Christ. Go to your heavenly Father who delights to give you good gifts and who is the architect of your salvation. Are you anxious? Turn your worry into prayer. As my brother would say, pray your problems. Are you joyful? Turn it into a prayer of rejoicing knowing that he is your sustenance. He is your source. He is the reason and the goal. In the promo for this event, it said I was going to talk about being counterculturally small and set that against maximizing your reach and potential. But I think that's a false dichotomy. By constantly chasing after whatever the culture puts out there as the latest, most important thing for a, mo a woman to realize her true potential, I think it actually saps you of your impact. Not just because that's a constantly moving goalpost, but because it begs the question, reach and potential for what exactly? Self-glory or God's glory? Instead, I would submit that by saying, I'm going to pour out my life for my family, for my church, and for my community, that is in fact where I am maximizing my reach and my potential. And it's not thinking small, it's thinking humbly. It's thinking flesh and blood real, like our Savior. And why do I do this? I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Thank you. Okay, well, the next part of our evening tonight is, is dealing with some of the questions that you all have submitted. And we got um, quite a few of them, and, I'm, and we just pulled some that we're going to cover tonight, and I hope, um, until our time runs out, and then um, I hope to be able to, girls, <laughs> when I get back on the radio, have them have at, at different times have them come and handle some of the questions that we'll we will not get to tonight um and and handle them there and i i i've been thinking about it since that came to my mind at some point i just really want to do that with them so y'all pray that you know that'll work out <laughs> but anyway i'm just going to start with the first one and it and it says this um could each of you tell us a little bit about how you do your personal quiet time and what you have found the most helpful in your time with the lord and that's for each one of you so someone go for it okay well i guess i'll start that since i mentioned it in my talk but I think the biggest thing for me, the biggest like hurdle is getting that idea out of my head that to spend time with the Lord and to encounter God, it has to be quiet. Um, because I have four children, the oldest is nine and the rest are younger. And there are, there are days actually where I am up before them and I'm able to actually have quiet time with the Lord. And I treasure that time so much. But reading God's word is about knowing the Lord and about who he is. And 
a lot of days that's just not the case. I actually think my kids must know when I get up earlier because then they get up earlier. <laughs> I remember we lived in, uh, when we were at seminary, we lived in apartments, and I would stuff like a towel under their door because I was convinced <laughs> that they could see the light coming out. But that being said, I just discovered that um, the Lord is, his word is there all day, every day, and I need it. I need it like I need food. And if I was hungry and I didn't get to sit down and have a great breakfast, I wouldn't say, well, then I'm just not going to eat today. Today's ruined. No, I would, I would grab a bite to go. And I think just um, reading God's word when I can, like I mentioned before, um, and actually reading the whole counsel of God. So I do um, think that like reading the whole Bible is, is important. And so I think having a plan where I'm reading the whole Bible and, and doing it when I can and knowing that, like, I think, Maureen, it was you, that I don't know how God's going to use a verse, but mm-hmm. he's going to use it at some point. And um, that's been super. So, so really, that's what I do is just read God's word as much as I can. And um, I've just found that to be so helpful. So. Mm-hmm. So I actually do my quiet time a little later on in the day. I usually start out the day like pretty fresh. I, like, I work out before the kids get up um, and, and I'm going pretty good, but like I, I take a, a deep dive in the day <laughs> and there's like mid afternoon, that's the time when I'm like, I could really use some time with the Lord and so that we can make it on in through dinner time <laughs> without, you know, things getting violent. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, um, so I, when the kids used to nap, they don't nap anymore. I do love a nap, but it doesn't happen real often. But that, during that, I, we still have quiet rest time. It's not real quiet. It sounds like they're moving furniture around. <laughs> but I still go in my room in the afternoon, and that's when I sit down. And I've just been, like, outlining through the Bible. I just started in Genesis because I'm like, I've been through chunks of the Bible through my whole life, and my parents were faithful to teach me God's Word, but I just wanted to have, like, a good full outline. So that's what I've been doing for the last long time. So I'll just read through like three chapters and I've got notebooks that I've been going through, just kind of write down, okay, what's happening, who's doing it. And then I'll just hand write out some scriptures that strike me. And that's where I am. And I spend some time in prayer, you know, praying for our pastors, praying for my husband, children, for our community, just things going on. Mm-hmm. So spending time in prayer, time in the word. And, and that rejuvenates me more than the mm-hmm. other thing that I'm tempted to do during that time, which is like, just read a bunch of gobbled- news articles. Gobbledygook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's when I do it. It's mm-hmm. like that's when good. I'm crashing in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. I would say for me over the years, it's definitely looked differently. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes it's at 5 a.m. Mm-hmm. I, like Grace and it, always feel like whenever I'm up earlier, the kids are up earlier. So I pretty much squash that <laughs> and said, let's just get the extra 30 minutes of sleep. <laughs> but I would say now in my life, my kids are 14, 12, 10, and 8. I really go to God's Word right now with the issues that we're dealing with and walking with with our children, uh, whether that be at school or a conversation they had with a teacher or Mm -hmm. another peer, we discuss that. And then I like to be able to study on my own, whatever the issue may be, so that when they ask, because your kids are always going to ask you really hard questions. And one, I think it's great to be honest with them, as I've told, especially my boys so many times, I don't have the answer right now, but I want to like help you and guide you and find this. Mm -hmm. So I found as a mom of not tiny people anymore, but still very dependent and seeking me out more for advice that it's, I benefit so much in my walk with the Lord by studying what's relevant in their lives. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes stays, the subject stays the same for two weeks. And then it's daily going up and down. Or I have two daughters, you know, emotions are flying high. And I'm definitely like my dad, like, get to business, dry up the tears, let's get on with the next task. And so it's not always easy for me to, like, get into the muck and mire of emotions. But that, I'm growing in that and asking the Lord to help me in that and to see that God, just like I said, 
We're all created uniquely and differently, and that's how God's gifted them to help train them with that. So I feel like for me, my quiet times currently are focusing on issues that my kids are dealing with. Mm -hmm. Any, that's good. Anything else before we move on? Do you want to say? Okay. Okay, the second question is this. Um, each of you have larger families. So I would love to know how you spend the time needed with each child on a day-to-day -day basis and how you deal with the struggles in your own life while still needing to give out to them. I can start that one off. Okay. Um, that's a hard question and a hard task for sure <laughs> to, to make. Number one, one thing that I've learned being a mom for 14 and a half years is to give myself so much grace. Like, I'm not going to do things perfectly. I always just pray that I don't mess up in the big things um, and that I'll always stay humble to go before my kids and to confess. But in terms of spending the right amount of time with each child individually, I really feel like this isn't really an answer. I know we as women sometimes want a one, two, three, but I feel like God really does give that time and provides it at a time when it's needed most. So for example, you know, I might have a child going through a certain situation or struggling with, you know, the ability to be able to do something that he or she really wants to do. God will always open up windows. And that's not that, like a gourmet restaurant necessarily. That might be in a car ride after dropping off one kid and we have 30 minutes in the car before picking up the fourth kid. And we are spending that one-on-one -on -one time together where I can actually hear them out. Um, that's actually what Jordan and I really try to do and pray that we will do well with is hearing our kids. Um, we had a man who's about 75 a couple summers ago. He and his wife are definitely like mentors to my husband and I, and he said, if I could change one thing about my parenting, and this is a Christian man, he said, it said I would make a big deal about the things that, my, that were big deals to my kids. And he's like, I don't mean, you know, patting them and their tantrums or coaxing them and something that's actually wrong, but actually listening. They didn't do as well as they wanted to in that race. They wanted their time to be a little better. They had been working harder. And for me, instead of saying, you know what? I had a child die, that's not a big deal. Instead, for me to get down and say, that is really hard and that's tough. And I remember what it was like to be 14, 12, 10, and eight. And those are the issues that are shaping them and molding them. So I feel like, don't think about it so much as like, I gotta get rid of all the other kids and have focus time, but just more taking the opportunity as issues arise to spend that quality time. And honestly, as Kess had talked about being tired and an old lady, I feel like that. My kids are entering into the teen years where they want to stay up to the wee hours. And by about 8, 12, I'm done. <laughs> and they're just getting amped up. And so asking the Lord to give you the strength to stay up some nights with them and to really hear them. And it's okay sometimes if you fall asleep while you're watching a show with them or loving them. <laughs> but that you would ask the Lord to give you the strength to do what you need to do. And he really will. That's, I mean, that's kind of, but in that, I've always been honest with my kids, whether it's date night or time I need to go down and get on the elliptical. Like, yeah, you may not like it, but this, if I'm better, your life is better. If dad and I have a great marriage, you have a better childhood. Like all these things work. You may not understand it right now, but I'm leaving you so that I could be a better mother. <laughs> I have been telling my kids that since my oldest was 18 months, crying as I left to go out to dinner. I promise I will be better tomorrow because I went on this date. <laughs> so just, we limit so much of what our kids, we think our kids can handle and understand, and they really mm. get way more than we give them credit for. So I feel like all that, just listen, cl stay close to the Lord, and he is going to show you when things pop up that you need to handle. And then take them to get a fun treat if you can, like maybe <laughs> something out of the ordinary that you don't usually have, or make them their favorite muffin or whatever it is. That's mm. my take. I love that because a dear friend of mine, she calls it filling her kids' love tanks. And I just love that because I think if you were to think about your day and think about, okay, this is what I need to do today. Also take care of myself, read my Bible, work out, keep, pick up the house, homeschool, whatever it is, the things that God's calling to you to do, it's so easy to get overwhelmed. And I think what Maureen was saying, it's 
And what I am learning is that I need God's strength. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, I need him to become a Christian. It's not the great Santa show. Yeah, it's It's not, I need him. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Or the kids at show. (laughs) Yeah, I need him every single day. It is a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) But I feel like he's so faithful when Mm -hmm. I am walking with him and coming to him and saying, Lord, I don't even know what to do at this moment, whether it's like a, a, a mothering moment or something where I really know I'm at the end of myself. And I know that in that moment, when I come to the Lord, that's where the glory to God takes place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that is where the wisdom hits me of what, whether it's from God's word or something, all of a sudden I'll be laying in bed and I think, I need to go check on that child and lay next to them and sing and pray with them. And I know that those are things that are gifts from God. So I think the answer for me would be just walking with the Lord. And I think the biggest thing is being in his word, like we talked about in prayer and, and just living your life like you really are not enough, Mm. you know, Mm. they nailed it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else no, to add? No. How about the second part of the question, dealing with the struggles in your own life? Oh, still needed. Yeah, Do you want yeah, to add yeah. any to that? I'm, I mean, I'll, I'll say real quick, just I think my children bring out a lot of the struggles in my own life. <laughs> so I see my sin, you know, because if I were, they, they show me my sin. And so I think that I'm actually dealing with the struggles of my life because I'm with my children and God is sanctifying me through them. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's a beautiful thing and it's a gift that I thank God for daily. Mm -hmm. um, That those, I don't go off in a corner and handle my own struggles, but we're right there and and I have that opportunity to actually handle them in front of them too, um, which is humbling. Well, I was going to say with that, that a lot of the things that children learn as you, as you think through that you're always discipling your children, you're either discipling them positively or it can be negative. But with that, as you are biblically handling the struggles mm-hmm. in your own life, they're learning from mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. You say, I'm really having a bad day today. My life, I mean, there's a lot of things I'm ungrateful for. Or there's something going on in my life that I can't even share with you children. But here's how I'm going to handle it. Mm-hmm. Like you, you can disciple and teach them through mm-hmm. those. And that's giving to them mm-hmm. as, yes. as you share with them that you're not like, oh, I'm just the perfect parent <laughs> and I have it all under control. And this is how you always need to behave. I'm having an issue right now and it's really hard for me. And I can't tell you all, but, you know, pray for me and I'm going to God's word. And this is, mm-hmm. you know, and I want it that because you, you're going to have these issues too. So that's, mm-hmm. you know a way that you're giving to them. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, number three. As a mother, what do you think is the most important way I can contribute to my daughter so to have the greatest impact on her relationship with God? So this, I don't know. I mean, Lord, Lord willing, I will be modeling this with my own daughters, but I know this from my own mother. Um... Her, the greatest way that she impacted me in my relationship with God was watching her walk with the Lord day in, day out, and not just seeing her being in the Word in the morning when she got up, and not just, you know, seeing her stand by my dad and, you know, seeing her do these things, but it was that as life circumstances kind of came and went and, and just the waves kind of hit the boat of our family, she was just steady. She was steady with the Lord. And it was like, you know what? She's not anxious. She's not worried because she had her eyes fixed on Jesus. And so I wasn't anxious because I, I just, I didn't even know things weren't all right. It was like, <laughs> she's fine. I don't know. I'm fine. And that was really from both of my parents. But uh, I, sometimes I think it's harder for us as women because we love stability and certainty and routine. And just that I had this, this mother who was just steady on trusting the Lord. Uh, I didn't know what a gift that was until I realized what a disaster I was and how hard that was to just like, just rely on him and trust him and faithfully just keep walking forward and just know, hey, it's all right. He, he commands the winds and the waves, you know? It's, it's going to be just fine. And, 
And so I guess like as a mother, as a, as a physical mother, and the, even as a spiritual mother in, in the church, there's um, an older woman in my church, Bonnie, who, who does the same thing for the young women in our church who will be worked up about something. She's guys, I've been there. Like, Jesus is on his throne. Like, let's stay the course. And so I think just this like, hey, we're just, we're following Jesus. We have our eyes fixed on him. The world may be going crazy. There may be COVID. There may be this, there may be that. But like, God is on his throne and we do not need to be afraid. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I'll piggyback off that, but I, I was just thinking, like, when you were talking, Kessa, about Deuteronomy 6 and how it talks about when you, when you stand up and when you lie down and how discipleship with our, with our kids and with our daughters isn't something that just happens at a specific time, but it happens as we live life. And mom, like, I think I can just say that this is what you did so well with me in that story I shared earlier about the piano was just that our faith is real. We serve a living God who cares about the details of our lives. And I think the greatest gift I could pass on to my girls would be to see that, that I'm, I love him and that I am dependent on him and that he is not far off from them. Mm. And that these little things, whether it be we can go to him about everything. And it's actually funny, uh, about a week, it was a few weeks ago, Charles had, had uh, lost a toy and we were looking for it. And he said, mom, we need to pray because God knows exactly where it is. And it just reminded me that like these little moments are the gifts that we're giving our children of discipleship. So anyway. Um, one thing I would add to that, that I hope my daughters, because I see in marriages today, they're just crumbling everywhere in the church and in the world. And one mm -hmm. thing that I talk with Claire and Grace about all the time is their dad. Um, mm -hmm. And just, we're always thankful for dad, even if he made mom irritated. Like, <laughs> we are always thankful for our dad and what he does and how he serves our family mm. and humbly gives to us. Mm. And I really want and pray that my girls aspire to find a man that loves the Lord with all of his heart mm. and then that would just keep every single last marriage vow that he's made, whether in sickness or in health and death all the things that Jordan has done for me and that the girls see and just lifting that up to them. I'm just excited to see if and who God will bring their way because I feel like their taste buds are going to be, <laughs> it's going to be hard. <laughs> um, you set the bar high. Yeah. <laughs> so that is something also dovetailing on what Grace Ann and Kess had said, of course, but also like mm, more specifically so true, yeah. for them just to see. Hmm that their mom really loves their father mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. they're committed to each other through mm -hmm. it all. And I'm glad you said that because that is so true today for all of us as women. We know the culture that we live in where women, our culture at large, just seeks to disrespect men on every level, on every level, whether they're little boys growing up, girls are better, girls rule, girls do this, girls do that. And to see women as these three do and other women in this church who I respect these little boys that God has given me. I respect my husband. I respect the men who are leading the church. I, to, and we it just, I'll just take this opportunity to remind all of us as women that we need to be on our knees praying for our men in this culture that we live in. Because, and even praying for our pastors who are being criticized and denigrated in ways they've never been before. It's in our culture at large, but even since this pandemic hit and what's going on and that people are more prone, it seems, to complain about everything. So I'm glad you brought that up. It's so important. It's so important for those of you and like for me who, who was raising four boys, but even now in the culture and having little boys growing up in a culture that seems to dis so disrespect them. And we can be agents of change in that in terms of respecting our little boys and building them in that regard and keep praying for them and being women who respect men. Even if we have, have, have men that we think they don't deserve our respect, 
But just because some men don't re deserve our respect, that doesn't mean all men. Mm -hmm. And we, we need to take that because we're, it's so easy for us to do that and not even realize that we're doing it. And so if you're married to a good man, then, and I didn't say perfect man, respect <laughs> that guy mm -hmm. and build him up and look for ways to encourage him because that speaks volumes to the daughters for knowing what to look for. And tonight we've talked about how these women are rare but real. But they're rare that, you know, an excellent husband who can find, he's, he's rare, but they're out there too. There's godly young men being raised by godly fathers. And we need more than ever as women who claim to know Christ to pray for them. And I personally just think now as never before because of this culture that we're living in that basically, you know, throws them under the bus all the time. So... That's my two cents. <laughs> okay, number four. It seems to be growing um, more counterculture for grandparents to be hands-on and involved in their counterculture, for grandparents to be hands-on and involved in their grandchildren's lives. I know it's difficult when most families live so far away, but can y'all share how allowing grandparents invest in your children's lives has impacted, influenced you and your children, and what has been most helpful to you? Oh, man. So, I mean, I feel so spoiled to be talking about this. Like, my parents and my in-laws are such a gift of grace to us. Like, they, their investment in our kids not just in wanting to teach them about the Lord, to teach them literally God's word when they spend time with them, but also to teach them how to bake, how to mm -hmm. sew, to mm -hmm. let them go nuts with crafts and dress up clothes <laughs> and, and, and just to, to teach them skills and to, and, and to fill in the gaps. I mean, we all have gaps, right? We're, we're limited in every house you do things a certain way and you don't even know the things you're missing and not. And so to have these, uh, these older women and, and men, their grandmothers and grandfathers who've gone before and have that wisdom and come in and help you kind of fill in the gap and see what's happening in their grandchildren's lives is so invaluable. And I'm so grateful that their homes are open and that they're willing to get in their cars and drive and that they love their grandchildren and they're flexible. I mean, I feel how I'm growing. I'm in my 30s and I'm already growing less flexible than I used to be. And I, I just want to say, like, I am being cognizant of practicing, like, still changing diapers and, and in the church and even, like, staying around toddler kids because I don't have toddler kids around my house right now. And I think that we all need to be doing that, like, staying fresh on those things so that we can stay flexible. We want to be always willing to have the little kids around. We always want to be willing to do that. But as grandparents, I am so thankful that Carl and Audrey are always welcoming the masses into their home <laughs> and my parents. And, and I think it's a two-way street. I think like as grandparents to open, open your lives and your homes and to invest in your grandchildren, what a gift that is. And then for the people who have the, the kids that you want your, your parents to invest in, that takes some flexibility. Mm -hmm. So that might mean getting your body in the car and driving to see them and staying at their house and like flexing a little on your end too. And maybe they don't do things exactly how you want them to do things. And like maybe when you gr grew up, like things weren't done just exactly how you thought they needed to be done. But it's like, it's a two way street. And even though, I mean, I hit the jackpot with my in-laws I, like, there are still things that we do differently because we come from different families. So, of course, with my mom, everything she does is perfect, right? <laughs> because it's my mom. But, like, I'm her daughter-in-law, so, of course, there's some stuff that I do that I'm sure she thinks, who is this bozo? But she doesn't, she doesn't ever let me know that. And so there's, like, there's grace and there's flexibility. <laughs> And so you just, you have to like, just know that it goes both ways with the children 
uh, with both with all the generations that you have to be flexible to make this work and mm -hmm. to get that rich investment from the other generations. Mm -hmm. Who is this bozo? <laughs> <laughs> I would also just add to that. Obviously, you know, and this question even says grandparents, I mean, they may live in California, you may live in Maine, and it's very hard geographically mm. to be together or to see each other that often. I know the things that have meant the most to me and my husband and our kids are just the little memories that are made, like whether it's Emma's pancakes or grandma's French toast, like all the things that we kind of think, back to my thing of like making a big deal about the things that are big deals to them. Like, wow, you get that excited over a pancake <laughs> or a piece of French toast. It's like, yes, but that's like even, and I think my kids have told you like, well, we're with Grandma Jolly, we eat French toast. Well, we're with you, we eat pancakes. <laughs> so like grandmothers out there, just make your own little memories with your grandchildren because they cling on to them. Mm -hmm. And they may seem insignificant to you at the time, but those are the things, I mean, I think my kids are always going to be talking about pancakes and French toast. Like, <laughs> so they'll probably make their wives, I mean, maybe, well, Luke will be handy in the kitchen, so he'll <laughs> whip up both. But the, um, so I think that is a critical part. And then just not comparing grandparents. Mm -hmm. Like some grandparents don't know the Lord, or maybe both mm -hmm. sets of grandparents don't know the Lord. Yes, you have to be careful about that and walk in wisdom. But also letting your parents in to love your kids. And again, back to Kesset's comment, everything's not going to be the same because we're all different people. Mm -hmm. Nothing under my roof is going to look the same under your yes. roof. And we need to be confident and okay with that. Because mm -hmm. um, we're still called to honor them. Yes. Like, honor your father and mother. That's not like a kiddie commandment. That's like a commandment for all Lifetime. of us. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. And so maybe naturally you have better relationships with a certain set over another, but... I feel like asking the Lord to make that clear to you mm -hmm. and when to let the kids mm -hmm. go or to have the grandparents come, or even when they come to your home, making it special, like having their favorite drink mm -hmm. or their favorite coffee mm -hmm. or peanut butter or whatever it is, like you also have those things so that mm -hmm. they feel welcome mm -hmm. in your home. As a daughter-in-law, I know sometimes maybe one day it's going to feel weird if we You'll have to do it four times over. Well, your sons-in-law, who knows what they're <laughs> going to be like. But, they, I mean, they, you may, may be thinking, maybe I'm not wanted here. And you want to make your home welcoming. Mm -hmm. So for the grandmothers, as a daughter and a mother, I just love when you guys make, mm -hmm. like, love our kids and care about what they care about. Mm -hmm. And even if it's silly. Just make a big deal about it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And I mean, I also am so blessed with just the best in-laws. And one of the things I love that both my mother-in-law and father-in-law have done and my parents is that they have saved our toys. And I know it's just like a small thing, but my kids think it is the coolest thing that at Grandma Lulu's, they have all of daddy's toys and they pull them out and they play with them. And my mom did the same thing. And I think that's kind of like a tip for us our generation is what are the little things we're doing now to prepare? I mean, maybe you don't have to save everything, but you know, like the little things that really make it special. And also just like they mentioned, like I love seeing my kids being loved on in a unique way that actually through my in-laws, I get to see in a very special way way. And my mother-in-law does this so well. She'll send, like when we started school, she sent a box like um, for back to school and she sent a letter in there and, and just wrote specific things about what she was praying for each one of my children as they started school. And even as we live far away, it just was so meaningful and it made them a part of our first day of school. Hmm. And so I love that. So yeah, that's great. Okay, number five. Um, this might be the last one. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure, Erica. <laughs> um, I'm graduating from high school this year. How did each of you find other Christians and grow in the Word when you left home? I think it's, um, it's important, like, whenever you get somewhere, just establishing first, like, who you are, my allegiance is to Christ, like, just, right. hey, this is who I am, and, and obviously, I mean, we touched on this as just immediately getting plugged into a Bible-believing church. Um, mm -hmm. That's something I tried to do when I went off to college. Um, so, yeah, just immediately getting plugged in to that Christian community, um, establishing 
those relationships, I think, sets you off on that mm -hmm. path. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like that's, you answered that great. I mean, I went to a, uh, you know, public college, and so um, it wasn't a Christian school. So I did, you know, when I got on campus, I actually didn't know anyone, so I needed to um, find other believers. And thankfully, at that time, it was very easy to do. Uh, there's a lot of ministries on campus, and I think immediately making those decisions on day one that you're going to pursue the Lord sets up that whole, um, you know, sets the stage for, mm -hmm. for school. And so. your schedule, too. Yeah. Like, how am I going to fill my time? Because you have that time, even when you're in school, and you don't you don't know it at that time, but you have more you time than yes, you ever you have more time. Have. <laughs> and so you want to be intentional about how you're going to set your schedule and what you're going to fill it with and, and doing that with intentional God-honoring things. Mm -hmm. um, I would just add to that as well, and this is something I tell my kids all the time, and I'm assuming you're a believer, you're asking this question, you desire Christian fellowship, but being confident in who God has called you to be. And knowing that your life, if you're walking with the Lord, is going to look so different from that of your peers. And you have mm -hmm. to be comfortable to flesh that out. And I've told my kids, and my two oldest have started mm -hmm. to see this, even though they doubted me initially. But then they come back. We've all, as moms, had those moments where your kids question, and they come back, and they're like, you were right. But just to be confident, and it's like, I, you know, so whatever your standards are, what God has called you to, to hold through those, but not to bury yourself in your dorm room or your apartment building or even your parents' attic or basement that you were in. <laughs> like, go out and then just be comfortable and confident in sharing that. And I always tell my kids, like, you will see at first, the initial response is kind of like, she's kind of weird. Like, she doesn't do that. But then the next thing you know, the next encounter, it's like you have all these people flocking towards you. And it, again, it's not about you or me or having 50 friends, but it is about not abandoning who God has called you to be. Mm -hmm. That's what I would Yeah, yeah that's, that's, great. that's great. Ladies, thank you so much for this peek right. into your life. You are, you are all rare. And we are thankful for your realness. So thank you, thank, thank you, thank you, you, Erica. And we have some special gifts. If, if I have the live stream basket, my daughters were just like, okay, I got this, I got my job. I'm, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. You're doing it. So we have a gift for a live streaming person. So you stay tuned. Let me dig deep. Okay. This is for Jenna. Jenna? I don't know your last name. So, but I bet you Miss Claudia does. So Jenna, you've got a gift coming to you. So let's give a clap for her. Thank you, hold that. And then I need, we've got two gifts for you in, in the audience. Oh, I'm so nervous. Okay, are you ready? Oh, Rebecca, it's you. She, she won the, <laughs> how are you getting the present? Rebecca! <laughs> All right, and the next gift. Can I have it? Can you, can you, can I have the present? Okay, thank you. You'll share with me, I know. Uh, Sue Straight. Sue. Yay, Sue, could you give her that? These gifts that you're receiving were graciously donated by a lady at our church. Um, so please, please enjoy. And ladies, thank you. You know, our house is not their house. We're all going back out to our own place. I can't, are you telling me something? Oh, you got to put your mask on. Keys. I don't have my glasses on. So I was like, I don't need my glasses, but I need my glasses because he's got to tell me something. There's keys. Somebody misplaced their keys. Black toy. This is not a giveaway. It could be black Toyota Corolla. So I've got your keys. So meet me up front if there you are. So I don't have my glasses on because I thought, I don't need no glasses. I need my glasses. But you don't need to know that. All right, I'm going to pray. And after I pray, um, the ladies are going to be at that front desk if you want to say hello to them as you go. Um, Father, I just thank you so, so much for this evening. I thank you for the lives of the women who shared, and I pray that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage them in the days ahead. Lord, I pray the same for us. As each of us leave this place, 
to situations that are different, to lives that look different. But God, you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I pray that we would all cling to you. We thank you for this church. I thank you for my sisters. I thank you for sisters who I don't even know yet as sisters. I pray that we would make you proud in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ladies.